As we delve deeper into educational technology, we must delve deeper into a whole new vocabulary. We look at what is culture. Well, Murphy and Potts describe it as a notoriously difficult word to define. In Latin and through to the 15th century, when it entered the English language, cultura meant cultivation or tillage. In the 16th century, the word became more metaphorical, referring to the cultivation of the mind or body. In the 19th century, it developed a, an upper-class attitude, culture. While Murphy and Potts describe culture as a dynamic and multiple thing, meaning that it's changing and seen differently by different people. I like to think of culture as all the ways of life that are passed down from generation to generation. Now, what about technology? What is that? Well, that's the way we do things. It's the use of techne or technique. And that brings us to technological determinism. You see, this is the belief that technology is the agent of social change. You know when you say you can't stop progress? Well, Alvin Toffler warns us that we need to protect ourselves from the dislocating effects of automation and computer technologies. And Marshall McLuhan is a technological determinist who defines history by technological change. He said, the medium is the message. And he felt that the global village is a result of the electronic age. Now, in contrast, we have cultural materialism. Raymond Williams was critical of McLuhan's theory of technological determinism because of what he left out of his analysis. He said social change is part of a, a historic process and is influenced by economic and political and institutional pressures, by social need and political intentions. For, for example, broadcasting is a major agent of social change and is driven by politics and economics, not just technological progress. This brings us to simulacra. Now, Jean Baudrillard suggested that the world we live in has been replaced by a copy world where we seek simulated stimuli and, and nothing more. He argues that a simulacrum is, is not a copy of the real, but becomes truth in its own right. He suggests that simulations have hijacked reality. And that brings us to hyper-reality. This is the inability of consciousness to distinguish reality from fantasy. Now look at this image. Is that real? Or is this hyper-real? Now this image, this is created by Terrapack. Um, it's software called Hyper-Real Rendering Software. Now we have intellectual property rights, IPRs. Now these are legal protections for product and concept development. They're typical forms of IPRs and they include copyrights and trademarks, patents, industrial design rights, and trade secrets. Now what core issues of IPRs arise in the design of online courses. Well, cor course designers have got to ask themselves this question. To what degree does an online course developer have the right to the reproduction, adaptation, distribution, performance, and display of information? Well, these issues are discussed in great detail in the website of the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. And this is their website. It's worth spending some time going through those links. Now, what are the protections and limitations of freedom of speech in cyberspace? 
Well, Lawrence Lessig, who wrote The Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, 1999, suggests that there are four basic modes of regulation for the Internet. There's the law. You see, many actions of the Internet, like gambling or pornography, fraud, these are regulated in similar ways online as they are offline. But there's also code architecture. You see, everything from the Internet filtering software to encryption programs falls within this category of regulation. Now, we also have norms. Just as certain patterns of conduct may cause an individual to be ostracized from our real-world society, so too certain actions will be self-regulated by the norms of whatever community one chooses to associate with on the Internet. Finally, we have the markets. You see, the increase in popularity of the Internet as a means of transacting all forms of commercial activity and as a forum for advertisement has brought the laws of supply and demand into the cyberspace. What protection of freedom of speech do your students have while they're on the web at school? Well, Canadian schools and libraries use filtering software, or blockers, to protect users from inappropriate sites. It's not perfect, but neither is censorship. Censorship is objected to by the laws. Finally, we have a variety of areas that you may choose to study. Communication studies. This is the study of well, communication. More or less, who says what to whom, in what channel, with what effect. Then we also have cultural studies, where we would um, study cultural phenomena, such as, in this case, science and technology. And we look at that from the point of view of various societies. Now we now have new areas such as cybercultural studies, the study of culture that has emerged from the use of computer networks for communication and entertainment and business. We have media studies, that's the study of media in society. You could study the content or the history or the role of media. You could look at journalism or cultural sociology. You could look at the political, economic, and creative content of the media. But now we have new media studies. What does that entail? Well, new media studies, a relatively new discipline that explores the intersections of computing with science and the humanities with the visual and performing arts.